Hello and welcome. My name is Mario Vitale and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Brad, Peaches, and Frank today. We're talking about La Cucina Piemontese. That's right, the cooking from the Piemonte, which if you're familiar with it, is in the far northwest corner of Italy. It's protected by the Alps, although it also has the Alps. So it enjoys a very interesting microclimate, somewhat passed over by many of the cool breezes, but still enjoying a nice cool climate in the fall and a relatively hot Mediterranean-like climate because it's right next to Liguria, which is right up there, right on the beautiful Mediterranean Sea. So what we're gonna make is three beautiful dishes based on the cooking of Torino, the capital of Piemonte. It's a banker city, it's a famous city, it's a big, big shoulders, kind of a Chicago city. It's kind of the second city to Milan as Chicago is to New York in many of the people's opinions of Italy. It's famous for making beautiful vermouth and a lot of great wine grows in Piemonte, perhaps the most famous of which is Barolo and Barbaresco. Today we're going to make three dishes, a minestrone, a tagarine, and a beautiful chicken liver dish, all three kind of representing some of the riches and the local products that make regional Italian cooking so delicious. The first step, of course, is a little minestrone di riso e fagioli, and that translates into a minestrone soup, and what they're going to use when they're making minestrone, and minestrone is made all over Italy, every different town, every different region, every different subculture has its own variation of minestrone. Minestrone, of course, being the larger version of minestra. Minestra means soup. Minestrone means big soup. It's often enough with vegetables and some kind of a starch, and generally the starch is whatever happens to be locally made. In this case, in Piemonte, they're famous for their rice as well as for their pasta dishes. Piemonte grows more rice annually than its neighbor Lombardia, which is famous for its risotto, particularly risotto alla milanese that they serve with the osso But we're gonna use in our minestrone basic vegetables, which are these carrots and onions. We're gonna start with butter. Whenever you're talking about the regions of Italy, it's always very interesting to discuss the lipid of choice, that is to say, the fat that they like to use, because that's gonna make a big difference in how they cook, and below Tuscany, it's generally considered to be the olive oil line. And between Tuscany and kind of the southern part of Lombardia, you get olive oil and then butter. And then up here in Piemonte, Lombardia, you're almost exclusively using butter. And then when we get up toward the border of Austria in the very, very northern part, you'll start to see a little bit of lard or pork fat up there in uh, Emerald Town, I believe they call it. So now we're going to start with the onions. We're going to take celery and carrots, and because it's a beautiful soup, we want to have peeled them, but we don't want to cut them so that they become obliterated. We're going to just chop them into relatively similarly thickened pieces. One of the things about soups, particularly in Italy, that you want to be able to taste and feel everything, but you don't want it to become something that is impossible to put on your spoon. So you would never cut anything that's going to go into a soup bigger than the face of your spoon. It's important. Mario, right, does the... Um is it different, different versions of minestrone based on different areas because it's a peasant soup? Yes, well, it's basically the whole concept of soup is whatever comes out of the ground that you have a lot of extra tends to be the traditional basis for all of your soups. So in the south, there'll be more chilies, there'll be a lot less meat, so there won't be any meat at all in soups in basilicata. But up here in Torino, we're gonna actually use beautiful fresh luganica or sausages, and we're just gonna cut those like this. And that really answers the question and that wherever it is, wherever it is, Whatever grows wherever you are is what really decides on what's going to be in it. So now we're going to take some sausage and we're going to add this right to our little what's called the sofrito. This is our first step in making just about anything is you take sofrito and you cook it with that lipid, which in this case was butter. You could use olive oil, you could use lard, but in trying to capture the different regional flavors of all the different regions of Italy, you want to try to use whatever they're using there. And if you could find it, if you were going to use an olive oil from Tuscany and try to make Tuscan dishes, that would be ideal. You wouldn't want to use a Spanish olive oil in creating a Tuscan dish because it just wouldn't work. Why not? Because it wouldn't taste very much like Spain at that point. Now, we've got this going. We don't want to caramelize this. We're trying not to make this too soft because we're going to cook it in the liquid itself, which is going to give it a different texture. If we wanted to bring this to like a very deep, dark caramelization, that would be something we might use for a braising, but it's certainly not going to be something we use for a soup. So now, we're going to take beans. These are borlotti beans, or brown beans, and this is what they look like in their natural field, right? And in the end of the summer, you get these shelling beans, Go ahead, take one apart. And you can taste them <laughs> just like this. They're great raw. If they haven't been dried, which all beans are, then these will just actually be edible right now, like they are. You might want to blanch them for a second, but they're actually very, very delicious. So we've soaked these beans overnight because these were dried beans, not the fresh beans. Mario, can you uh, cook dried beans without soaking them? Um, 
You could, it would take a lot longer. If you don't soak the beans, it takes them literally three times as long to cook because they haven't had enough liquid put in them and they become very, very hard. There's also an issue in many people's minds as to whether soaking them really relieves some of the flatulence issue. <laughs> I believe that to be true. So we always soak our beans. You can quick soak your beans by putting them in cold water, bring them to a boil and turning them off. That's like six hours worth of soaking in 10 minutes. So now I add the beans. I'm gonna add the rice. Now, of course, in Piemonte, we're using a short grain arborio rice. That's the kind that grows there. That's the kind you would use to make risotto. That is also kind of starchy and it adds a certain amount of unbelievably beautiful texture. This will not have the texture of a risotto though because it's going to be fully cooked through. So it's gonna give up that starch, it's gonna be relatively soft. And that's what's gonna make it a soup as opposed to a rice dish. Then we're gonna take, now in the poor regions we would probably use water. But since we're up here where all the bankers hang out, we're going to use chicken stock because we have our slaves to do that. Did you make that chicken stock? We make this a brown chicken stock. What you do is you brown the bones and you brown the vegetables in a hot roasting pan. Then you throw it in with the water and all of your aromatics. Then I'm going to crush some tomatoes. These are three canned tomatoes. Pretty much any time I cook with a tomato, I use a canned tomato. And when I have them in the beautiful part of August, September, and October, which is real tomato season, then I tend not to cook with them. I just serve them with a little bit of salt. Can you use a canned chicken stock? You can definitely use a canned chicken stock. The key to good canned chicken stock is making sure you find one that's low sodium. Because in the cooking times of the kind of soups that we're going to make, which actually reduce the stocks by the stocks by 20 to 30 percent, it'll become a little bit salty. So buy that low sodium one or the organic one if you can. Now, to finish that off, I'm going to add this cabbage. We're going to bring the whole thing to a boil, and when we come back, we're going to serve it up with a little bread and a little drizzle of oil, so please stay with us. I quit the circus for this show. <laughs> Hey, welcome back. Now, as you see, our soup has thickened. The viscosity level is incredible. That's because of the creaminess of the rice, but also because everything else is kind of broken down. Because we cut our vegetables properly, however, they still have a little integrity. And you can see the beans have not exploded, which is our ideal. Frankie, why don't you grate a little bit of the undisputed king of cheeses over the top of that and pass them on down to peaches and bread. <laughs> now, this would be served often enough, even at room temperature, in the summer. They don't really get down with the hot stuff because they have the hot weather so prevalent in the Piemonte, which helps, of course, grow those magnificent grapes, the Nebbiolo grapes, which, from which we make Barbaresco and Barolo. Here, though, with a simple first course like this, I think we're going to try just a simple little Barbera by my good friend Paolo Scavino, which I think will be just excellent. Sometimes when food and wine come together, the sum is better than the two different parts added together. It can become something really poetic. Go ahead and bon appetito there, and then <laughs> if you need a little bread, there you go, guys. Well, Just long, break it up. How long does it, the soup take to cook? This takes when at least as long as it takes to cook the rice till it's soft. And the beans might be an issue had we not soaked them. So this is at least 45 minutes, but this texture right here is probably closer to an hour, hour and a half. But you, you can overcook it, though. You have to keep that in mind. You can definitely make this too much of a mush, which would create the wrong thought for this beautiful minestra, the fagioli riso. Yes? Um, do you leave the top off the whole time? I do. Now, if that, that's because I wanted to reduce that stock a little bit to intensify the flavors. If you didn't want to do that, you would leave the top on, and that would keep everything in there, but it wouldn't become more intense. That's also something that you want to do when you want to maintain a certain texture. I wanted it to become more thick and more dense. Now we're going to make something called tagliarini, which is very much based on the word taglia, tagliarini or tagliatelle. It's an egg pasta, but because we're up here where the rich bankers are, we're really <laughs> obsessing about richness and making something incredibly even that much more flavorful. So what we're going to do is we're going to take egg yolks and get rid of the whites. This is a very traditional pasta served often enough just with white truffles in white truffle season. That's right, that beautiful part of the year from about the end of October through January when the white diamonds of the Piemonte are served. Are white truffles better than dark truffles? Uh, white truffles and black truffles are two entirely different animals. The whites are more expensive because they're more rare. In my opinion, it's like apples and oranges. I love them both for what they do and, and how they are, but 
given my druthers, it's a white truffle game for me. So now, in the same old style well method, what we're going to do is we're going to mix this. And you can see it's going to be a little bit more tender of a pasta because you don't have all that egg white or that albumin there to kind of soften it or to make it more firm. But the technical aspect is exactly the same. Now, we're just going to bring it together with the fork just like that. And you could do this in a mixer, but if you were going to do it in the mixer, you wouldn't be watching me here on Molto Maria. <laughs> You'd be watching like speedy meals for quick people on a hurry. But what we're going to do is we're just going to bring that together. And what you always want to do, we, even with your measured ingredients, it's better to have them be a little too wet than a little too dry. So I always make sure that I have just a little bit more liquid than normal. And I always set aside a little bit of the dry ingredients to make that happen. Now what we're going to do is we're going to knead this. And you want to just bring it together so that it comes together. Then at that point, we're going to kind of remove some of that excess dry and clench it so that it forms a ball. Now then, we start the kneading process, which is just to say that you want to kind of squish and pull, squish and pull. And as that kind of dry stuff shakes out, you don't worry about it. But you want to just knead it. And what you're going to do is knead it for five or six minutes until it fully comes together. And then what you're doing at this point is starting to develop that gluten, which is going to give it that kind of elasticity when you finally get around to it. But since I got a lot of other things I want to do, and you've seen now how the tireen comes together, we're going to start by making the condiment. The condiment, of course, condimento is the way that we sauce our pastas. We're going to make this with a little bit of the fegatelli or the chicken litters. I'm going to chicken livers. I'm going to take a little bit of oil and a little bit of butter because now we're up here where the riches are, and we love that kind of combination flavor. We're going to take some onions, and I'd say that's about one Spanish onion. And right now I'm going to add salt to it because I want it to start immediately exuding that liquid. As soon as you add salt to something, it starts to break down, the liquid starts to come out. And that's because it challenges the cell wall and immediately starts to get to an equilibrium. That's a good thing. <laughs> then what we're going to do is we're going to take some chicken livers. Now these are just the kind, you know, whatever, they're a buck a pound. So although that they're considered quite exotic in a lot of people's kitchens, I don't know why, because they're so good, they're so tasty, and they're very affordable. What we're going to do is we're going to just add those chicken livers to the pan with the onions and we're going to cook them until the onions start to slowly break down and the chicken livers start to fall apart. At that point I'm going to mash them. Now, this pasta, after it had rested for a half hour, miraculously looks like this. It loses that kind of bumpy texture, becomes something a little bit smoother. What you need here is either one of these kind of additional machineries or the old hand thing, just to crank it through. And then what you just want to do is you start it on the biggest number, and you just float it through. Now for tallarine, we're not going to take it down to absolutely paper thin. We're probably just going to take it down to, say, number four, which is a far cry from number 11. When we come back, I'll show you how we finish up by cutting these noodles by hand. And then we're going to make a delicious risotto dish in the style of La Financiera. So please, stay with us. Welcome back. Now, what I've done is I've mashed up my chicken livers with the spoon here and added just a little bit of that beautiful dolcetto. That's going to more or less create the sauce because I'm going to add just a little bit of butter. I'd say that's about a tablespoon, <laughs> huh? And we're going to stir that through. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take the noodles that we just ran through the sheeter here and we're just going to carefully fold them and then cut them by hand because these are literally going to cook in seconds because these are so fresh. Often enough when you make a fresh pasta, you'll allow it to dry a little bit and then even let it to dry all day because they don't make it to order. They'll make it in the morning. The old uh, sfoglierinas, the, the ladies come through and make the pasta for the restaurants and they can just go home. And they allow it to sit on these kind of like netty looking sheets. Now what I've got here is we want to make sure that our water's hot. We're going to drop it in. We're going to season it right as we add the noodles because it's really irrelevant whether it was seasoned or not before. The best way to remember to put the salt in the pasta water is whenever the pasta goes in, you make sure you do it. So those are going to cook 
relatively quickly. In the interim, however, we're going to start our next dish, which is risotto or fegatelli or chicken livers in the style of the financer. And it's a risotto dish. It's one of those few dishes like Oso Buco, where they serve the rice and the protein at the exact same time. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start by making the risotto. We're using that same short grain rice. <laughs> we're going to add onions to create our own little sofrito. Frank, if you could hand me those other uh, chicken livers. And now I want these to soften up just like I did before, so I'm going to add a little bit of salt very, very quickly. And this is a very traditional risotto preparation. We're just going to make a standard white wine risotto. Then we're going to take these fegatelli, or these chicken livers, and you could use calf liver, you could use even chicken pieces for that matter, if you just wanted to use some of that heinous victim, the boneless chicken breast. You could, because it would be good, because you're going to be cooking it properly. So what we want to do is keep the whole thing going. We've got it all going. We've got our risotto going. Now we're going to cook our livers. And the trick to making it a la financiera is to save a little bit of the white truffles, but also cook it with a little marsala. Marsala at that point, or at any point up until about 50 years ago, being an exotic ingredient imported from Sicily. So anytime they're using something that's kind of imported, it feels like you're doing something exotic or something worthy of a, the finance guys. Now the pasta is just about done. Our onions have softened and need just a couple more seconds, but I'm going to add the rice because what we want to do in making any risotto is rosolare. That is to say, toast it in the pan with no liquid whatsoever. The pan surface right now is about 350, 355. As soon as you add liquid, it's going to only be maxing out at 212, which is the boiling temperature. So we're toasting that rice and it's going to kind of seal in some of that starch to make it really, really succulent. Now our noodles are just done. We want to drain them. We're going to take a little bit of that pasta water to create a starchy medium. And then we're just going to toss it through like we always do. Now, of course, you can see the cackling Torinese bankers counting their guilt and thinking how great life's going to be because they're having this beautiful pasta. But what we're going to do first is while it's still on the heat, we're going to add a little bit of the indisputed king of cheeses. Now I'm going to turn the heat off. I'm going to stir my rice one more time. And then I'm going to add a little bit of red wine, not white wine. As I said before, it was a half cup of red wine. Mario, does it matter what kind? It just affects the final flavor, presentation, and texture of the dish. Other than that, there's really <laughs> wow. no difference whatsoever. So now your pasta. Just like anywhere else in Italy, just because we're up here in the north with the rich guys doesn't mean we're going to oversauce it. We're still going to take it to the plate like so. And then, to just let them know who's boss, we're going to grate or shave a little black truffle over the top. We take our little taglia tartufo and we just start pumping it through like that. Is it coming out? You know what? What we discovered this year at Baba was to grate it over like this is even more sensual of an experience. Now, I've got my livers popping in the back. Frankie, I'd like you to serve this pasta up. Here's some plates. Here's some tongs. To continue with my risotto, I'm going to start now adding slowly just enough stock to get it covered. And then as it goes below the top of the rice, I'll add just another ladle all the time. This is brown chicken stock. To my chicken livers, I'm going to flip them over and we're going to serve them almost kind of medium rare inside. Just a little pink, not medium rare. Just this side of medium well, actually. And the way we're going to continue that cook is with a little bit of that marsala. When we come back, I'll show you how we bring the whole thing together and make it delicious. So please, stay with us. Now, as our risotto comes completely together, it's totally cooked, and yet it's still slightly al dente. What we want to do is cook it just until it's got that right texture, and then we want to lower the heat to almost completely off. We're going to add, oh, I don't know, a quarter cup of butter. 
and we're going to do what's called mantecare. That is to say, nearly emulsify that butter in there. And what that's going to do is give us that rich, rich bankerly texture that we're looking for, completely smooth and yet luxurious. Then I'm going to take about three quarters of a cup of Parmesan cheese, and I'm going to stir that through just like so. To finish the fegatelli, we add a little bit of that, and then we take it right to the plate like so. A nice wet amount of risotto, on top of which goes those beautiful chicken livers, and that is the dish. I want to thank you guys for being here. You made a heck of a lot of fun. I want to thank you guys for being here, and I look forward to seeing you on the next Molto Mario. Ciao.